As I stated, God's sovereignty is understood even in the story of the gospel. The gospel is the divine plan of God and was foreordained before the foundation of the world. What that means is it was not possible that Jesus somehow wouldn't have died, been buried, and rose again. Upon hearing that I've converted and now believe in a high view of God's sovereignty, that alone triggers my Baptist brethren immediately. The term sovereignty even can provoke a variety of responses, fortunately one of which still is a hearty amen. Yet there are plenty of those who would recoil or even bristle in some cases at the idea of God being sovereign. Ironically, though, all Christians of all flavors, shapes, and sizes believe in God's sovereignty. And I know this because they must in order to understand the story of the gospel, as we'll see in a minute. The word sovereign simply means to reign over or to rule over. The doctrine of God's sovereignty states that God rules in and over the affairs of man. Now, as I said, I personally adhere to a high view of God's sovereignty. And of course, as I've hinted at here, there are differing views on how this looks and to what degree. But nevertheless, the point still remains that in Christianity, historically and traditionally, it has been taught that God works in and through human history. Otherwise, if you don't believe that, you are not a theist, my friend, but a deist. Sometimes Christians and ashamedly pastors even who aren't well read, and yeah, that shot's fired and you know who you are, they use sovereign as a sort of trigger word where it's merely an association game, claiming God's sovereignty equals some radical version of tulip that they've created. And then with it, they attach ridiculous caricatures. These pastors operate as disingenuous sensationalists. They abuse and misunderstand scripture and then scare well-intentioned Christians away from the biblical doctrine of sovereignty. Now, in spite of all this, there are still honest Christians that may have a few sticking points or objections. Objection number one, God can't be sovereign because man has free will. Critics of God's sovereignty will purport that God must be forcing people against their will if he is to be sovereign. This objection may seem somewhat reasonable on the surface, and that's only because it contains some validity, i.e. man does have free will. But the problem is it also contains a false assumption that's been smuggled in. Namely, it presupposes that God's sovereignty and man's free will are mutually exclusive. That is to say, God can't be sovereign if man is free, or man can't be free if God is sovereign. The reality is, though, that this is a lapse in logic and a misunderstanding of Scripture. And as we'll see in a minute, the Bible teaches both. Both. God is sovereign, but he has also at the same time granted man free will. The second objection is the word sovereign isn't in the Bible. Now, just because a specific word doesn't appear in the Bible does not mean that the idea or concept isn't in the Bible. For instance, the word Trinity never appears in Scripture, yet the Trinity is a biblical teaching. Not the social trinity, of course, but the biblical, orthodox, classical version of the trinity. So although the exact word sovereign isn't used, the Bible is replete with the teaching, quite literally from Genesis to Revelation. As I stated, God's sovereignty is understood even in the story of the gospel. The gospel is the divine plan of God and was foreordained before the foundation of the world. What that means is it was not possible that Jesus somehow wouldn't have died, been buried, and rose again. But nevertheless, at the same time, we understand that the entire event of the gospel occurred at the hands of men and as a result of man's free will choices. God executed his plan precisely in and through man. Now, allow me to illustrate this with scripture. In Acts chapter 4, verse 27, Peter says this in a prayer to God the Father. For of a truth against thy holy child Jesus, whom thou hast anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate with the Gentiles and the people of Israel were gathered together for to do whatsoever thy hand and thy counsel determined before to be done. All Christians acknowledge that Pilate, Herod, Israel, the Gentiles, that all of them had free will. No one believes that they were forced. The Jews had their agenda. Pilate had his personal conflict. And then, of course, for the Roman soldiers, that would be the Gentiles. It was just another day at the office for them, you could say. But also, on the other hand, they all played a crucial part in God's divine plan of the gospel and the story of the crucifixion. And it was foreordained. So although we confirm over here that they gathered themselves together for their own purposes— Peter also says that they were gathered together by God for to do whatsoever his hand and his counsel determined before to be done. So lucidly, Scripture teaches that what they were doing was fulfilling God's will. He's the one that willed it, who wanted it, 
and then he himself brought it to pass. It says it was his counsel referring to his will, and then it says it was done by his hand, which is to say that he executed it. He guided it to his determined end. Furthermore, it occurred precisely as he determined it, hence whatsoever he determined to be done. The crucifixion wasn't an accident. It wasn't something that God just kind of rolled with. On the contrary, the Bible teaches that the lamb was slain from the foundation of the world. Therefore, everything, that is each person involved in what they did, God had already determined before would be done. He did so, and he did so not in spite of man's free will, but through it and with it. For instance, when the Roman soldiers mocked Christ putting the robe on him and the crown of thorns on his head, it wasn't random. But it was determined by God. And of course, it was meant to be a symbol of the Messiah bearing our curse on his head. This was foreordained. It was foreordained just like Pilate's sign above the cross and his refusal to change it was foreordained. So now, once you concede to God's sovereignty in the story of the gospel, and it doesn't corrupt or discount man's free will, you're left in this awkward place of explaining why this is the only time where this was possible for God. And if you do so, you've now limited God's sovereignty with no scriptural basis or reason. If God's sovereignty doesn't compromise man's free will in the story of the gospel, why would you have the hubris to suggest that it would elsewhere? As a matter of fact, God's word teaches that even the random act of the lot being cast into the lap that the disposing thereof is of the Lord. 